Um, now we come to the part of the, of the presentation that, uh, uh, that I get paid for, so to speak. Um, my name is Elliot Goldstein, and I'm the chair of, of today's uh, seminar. I'm sure you already know that. I'm also uh, here to, today to present the part of the course, uh, the seminar that deals with uh, uh, forensic video and photography. And um, the best way, of course, to illustrate that is to, uh, to actually show you some videotapes, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, but before I get into showing you the videotapes, I'd like to give you a little bit of background information and maybe go through some of the, a, a bit of an outline of what we're going to be dealing with in the next uh, uh, half an hour or so. The, um, I hope you can all see me here. I, I, I'm over, I'll, whichever, I'll go over on this side. Um, the, um, the use of photography in, in Canadian courtrooms started um, back uh, a number of years ago and uh, as far back as about 1920 when the first pictures came in. Um, as the technology developed and we went from still pictures to motion pictures and then the, um, the electronics came in, we moved into video, now we're at the point where we're using digital imagery in court. The, the law was slow to adapt to the change in technology. As a matter of fact, the, compared to the United States, I would say some of our cases were as much as 10 years behind. Um, it shouldn't come as any surprise for you uh, to hear that at least in the United States, the, the development of the law focused on the two areas of the country where this certain technologies developed. In uh, California, where they had uh, the motion picture industry, uh, when times were slow, um, the cinematographers went and did work for lawyers. And a lot of the, the, the really good motion picture cases uh, came out of the state of California, which is where the movie industry started. On the other coast, in the East Coast, um, in, uh, in New York, um, we had a lot of the video cases first coming out of the state of New York because that's where the video uh, got started. Of course, there was, a, there was also video over in the California side, but you'll find that some of the uh, primary cases are coming from New York State because the television industry developed there and people began using uh, portable video. In the old days, the porta pack uh, camera was as, the camera alone was as big as what we now have as a, as a small camera um, handheld unit, handy cam or palm cord or whatever you, you call these new digital systems. And then a person would wear on their side an actual videotape machine half inch with reel to reel, etc. Eventually the technology developed and it got smaller and smaller and smaller and the police began using video and eventually the, the personal injury lawyers began using it. Um, there are many, many uses for video and photographs in the courtroom. The, the book that I wrote started out as one volume, it's now two because of the, of the tremendous amount of law that's now in this area. Um, but still, the, the technology developed a lot faster than the law, and sometimes the cases, um, if you look at them, you'll see that the judges were really not comfortable with the technology. They tried to apply older principles of law, um, things like uh, um, the best evidence rule, and some of these other rules that they tried to apply to photographic and videotape evidence, but it really, they needed to create some new rules um, in order to deal with the new technology. Now, the way that forensic video and photography differs from ordinary uh, photography and video in the courtroom is that it focuses on uh, its use to um, specifically to explain um, how something happened or to compare things. Okay, there's a many uses for video involving rec con recording confessions, witnesses, statements, etc., that don't really have a forensic aspect to them. But when you get into things like ballistics comparisons, a view of the crime scene, a view of an accident scene, um, we'll see a videotape today of, of uh, the plaintiff's theory of how a personal injury occurred where you get into to more of the um, explanation type videos as opposed to demonstration videos, you'll see that there is uh, uh, a definite forensic component to it. Forensic doesn't necessarily just mean criminal. 
Uh, you can have a forensic videotape that's used in a, in a civil case, uh, for example, surveillance. Uh, most of the videotapes uh, that are being tendered in court are surveillance videotapes, and I've got some examples of surveillance to show you too. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll show you a few tricks when you're viewing a surveillance videotape, what types of things to look for. Now, aside from all that, there's also the issue of demonstrative evidence in general. Okay? And demonstrative evidence, um, in the United States, demonstrative evidence includes video, photographs, etc. In Canada, we tend to refer to demonstrative evidence as things like charts, graphs, diagrams, models, anatomical exhibits, things that are other than, than photographs or, or videotapes. Um, and there's... Uh, uh, I have, um, there's a, an actual course I'll tell you about later that we've proposed for the Institute of Law Clerks, a fellowship level course for those of you who are interested. Uh, we're putting together a proposal for that dealing with demonstrative evidence as a whole. But um, the other aspect about uh, the admissibility, or sorry, about the uh, forensic um, uh, evidence is um, oftentimes the admissibility is in question. In a number of, of cases, uh, civil cases, there might be an agreement that a witness's statement might go in or a view of a scene, an accident scene might go in and there's not going to be a, a voir dire um, uh, necessarily. In, in most of the forensic cases, um, there's the, the admissibility of the evidence will be challenged by one side or the other. And it's not always the Crown that puts in that type of forensic evidence. Oftentimes it's, it's the, uh, the defense in criminal cases that will bring it in too. And of course in civil cases, it's the, usually it's the defendant insurance companies that hire the, the surveillance people to go out and take pictures of the plaintiff. So it's the defendants uh, who are bringing it in in, the, uh, in many of the uh, civil cases, not just the, the plaintiffs who are uh, showing uh, uh, the condition of the, uh, or plaintiff's counsel showing condition of the plaintiffs. Okay, I think what I'd like to do is to, to, to show you a videotape and then explain a little bit about it and talk about some of the forensic aspects of the videotape. Um, it is a, these are surveillance videotapes. Now, in surveillance videotapes, if ever you come across a surveillance videotape, I always tell people whenever you're looking at it, first of all, look at it three times. Most cases, there's no sound on a surveillance videotape uh, if it's, if it's uh, outside. Um, if there is sound, there's other issues dealing with, with the criminal code. But let's assume for the moment it's a, a picture-only tape. Uh, always look at it three times. The first time, look at it for just what's happening. The second time, look for things like the time-date code. Uh, look for instances of editing. Um, and the third time, look at it from the standpoint of really what is this videotape trying to show? How could, we, how could we use it? Or how might it be attacked by the other side if there's any problems in the tape? And I'll give you some examples of that. So let's take a look now at some videotapes here. I hope you can all see this. Um, you might want to move to the center area because I don't know if you can see it from that, from that angle. And I don't know how well it will be picked up by our, uh, our TV screen. Okay, I'll just get around the front here and we'll press play. Uh, let's hope that it does. Okay, it may just take a moment to get up to speed. Okay, what we're going to be looking at is a surveillance videotape of a person stealing some money. You can see the money's just gone into his pocket there. And, uh, We'll, uh, the next sequence here, you'll see also an individual. This is a, a cashier, um, and I, I want you to watch his hands and watch the area of the cash register, and you will see what, what's being done there. In this particular case, he's very sloppy about the money. Now watch the edge of this bill here. Watch what happens to the bill and where it goes. Of course, this is not part of his job description. This is taking place, this is fellow's a cashier at a um, uh, stationery store. And uh, you see he pushes his body up against the side of the cash machine, the cash register. And eventually you'll see his hand move toward 
the, uh, the bill and pull it out. It was sticking out of the drawer when it was closed, and he's put that, into, in, that money into his pocket. And he's not supposed to do that. That's theft. Okay. Does he know he's under a videotape? Absolutely not. If he was, he wouldn't. The camera was hidden, which is an, it's a very interesting question because this was a pinhole camera that was in the roof, uh, hidden in the roof. Now, look at which wrist his watch is on. That's important. Which wrist is it on? It's on his what? Right, right wrist. Now, most people wear their watches on their left wrist. So it means one of two things. Either he's left-handed or the pinhole lens has done a mirror image reversal of, uh, of what's going on. Now, if that's true, if the image has been reversed right to left, then you can't tell the value of the bill based on which drawer within the cash register he's pulled the bill out of because everything's been flipped over. So one of the things I always look for is little things like, is writing reversed? Is the watch apparently on the wrong hand? Because that tells me they might have used a lens that switches it left to right. And that could be very important in court. Now this is a situation here where this is a delivery dock. A delivery dock means that goods come out of the truck and they go into the warehouse. But let's see what happens here with this particular individual. Uh, he gets a little bit impatient and uh, hurry up, he says, my goodness, there go the profits right out of the warehouse into a delivery truck. They were very expensive pens, a box of them, thousands of dollars worth of pens. And because he doesn't want anybody stealing what he's just taken, he closes it and adjusts the leveler, which is the ramp that goes up to the back of the truck. You see the, the date eight code there, and we see another sequence uh, with this fellow again. Oh, he's helping himself to more things. There's a lot of theft by delivery people because they can move around very quickly and it's normal to see them carrying things in and out of buildings. Okay, I'm just going to stop it there just for a moment and tell you a little bit about day date code. Okay, On most video surveillance system nowadays there is a code optically imprinted on the, the picture that you're watching, which is the day and the date. And it's usually some combination of two-digit numbers. It's usually day, month, year in some order. Now that's really important and don't get tricked up on this one, okay? Metrically, you put year, month, day. That's standard everywhere in the world. But, and I can't remember whether it's in England or in the United States, it's day, month, year, month, day, year. Now, if the number is higher than 12, you know right away that it is the day, not the month, because there's no, no such, there's no 13th month, okay? But if it's 3599, is that March the 5th, 99, or is that um, the third day of May, 99? Be very careful about that, because I had somebody once ask me about that in court, where I was called as a, uh, to authenticate a picture. And the guy says, well, what about the numbers there? What day was it? That was, uh, it wasn't March. It was some other date. And I said, no. And he said, well, how do you know? And I said, well, I set it in the back of my camera, and I brought my camera, and look. And I brought the camera with me, and sure enough, it said month, day, year on the little dials at the back of the camera where you could optically set it. And I testified, swore then, that I had set it properly. And I also testified I checked my watch. Okay, so be very careful about day date. Okay, now another these are tricks, right? You got to know these things. The other thing is with respect to the the time code itself. If the numbers all of a sudden jump, that should tell you that somebody has edited some sequence out of the videotape. If you've got a, something like 061923, that means 619 in the morning, 23 seconds. If it all of a sudden jumps to 623 in the morning. What happened to those three, four minutes? Where are they? So watch the day-date code. It's okay, I also told you about the lettering, if it's reversed. The only time it should be reversed is if you're looking at an ambulance. You know, because ambulances have on the front part of them, they have wording written the other way. Why? So that when people are looking at the rear view mirror, as if they don't already know that this big yellow thing or red and white thing with the flashing is an ambulance, people say, oh, that's an ambulance, A, M, B, and you get your kid to read it to you, you know? Okay. Um, now, the next thing I just want to uh, discuss, 
um, with respect to uh, surveillance. Um, I always tell people, don't just look at the incident itself, look at things that happened before and after. And that's very, very important. Have them bring the entire tape to you, the source tape. Look it all over. You never know what you're going to find leading up to or after the particular incident. Now, when people show me videotapes of um, convenience store robberies, they always have this guy come running in with his face dis um, covered up. There's a disguise that's worn, okay? They're either wearing a hat or they're always walking in like this and you can't see the faces. I know the place has been robbed. What I want to find out is who did it. So I tell them, do you have surveillance tapes from earlier that day or earlier that week? Show them to me. And sure enough, you'll see the same guy coming in the only difference is he's not wearing the mask or the hood or the balaclava or whatever that thing, the ski hood, whatever. And he's coming, he's wearing the same jacket. Okay, so he's changed his jacket. What's the last, person, the last thing a person will ever change? Their shoes. Okay, because it's hard to break in a new pair of shoes. So you, they come in, they're wearing the same medallions, they're wearing the same uniform, the same outfit, the same clothing, but except one time they have no mask on and the other time they have their covered up. And you get the, the tape taken an hour earlier when the guy's coming in to case the joint. They always do this left to right shoulder thing. That's, you always tell shoplifters that way. You just watch them on the videotapes and you got him. There's the guy. He's doing the shoulder check. There's the hand goes out. Or if he's standing back to back with somebody and they, they do the pickpockets, will never come right up behind you. Okay, if you're going to pick somebody's pocket, the one part of the body you don't want to touch is their butt. People are very butt sensitive, okay? You touch a woman's butt, that's it. She turns around, she smacks you, and you've got a, a harassment lawsuit, okay? Assault. You don't, so these guys will turn around back to the person, and they'll take the thing from the person, put it in their pocket, and walk away. You'd be surprised at how close you can get to people and actually listen to every word they're saying just by not looking at them. I'll sometimes do it on the street, walk up to these. I know they're lawyers. Because they're the biggest loudmouths in the street. You know, they're always talking, and I'll walk up to them, I'll be looking like this. I'm two inches away from them, I'm listening to everything they say, and they don't think I'm paying any attention to them because I'm not looking at them. I'm looking over here, and they may even look over the seat I'm looking at. I'm not looking at anything over there, I'm listening. Okay? People, don't, pe people will notice what other people are doing if they think that they're being watched. If they don't think they're being watched, they'll do all sorts of crazy things, and that's what we're going to see in this next video. I'll take a look at what happened to this lady who didn't think she was being watched. Okay? Now this lady works in a department store and there's a conveyor belt in front of her which is very noisy and all these shirts and other things are coming down the belt and she has to sort them out. I don't know why but that's her job. Somebody does it. And you'll see what she does. She's taking the clothing and she's stuffing it down the front of her pants. Okay? Why is she doing that? That's a good question. Probably because she expects to take, walk out of the store with that material, not pay for it. It's called employee theft. But you'll see what happens as various items come by. And she's very selective about what she's stealing. She's supposed to be sorting this stuff out. And you'll see that she's actually uh, not doing her job. She's, oh, there's the shoulder check. Did you catch it? Yeah, she wanted to see if anybody was watching her. Now, this, this illustrates, this videotape illustrates why it's very important to keep the camera running after the individual has been apprehended. There's the security officer wearing a uniform. She doesn't know that he's behind her. She can't hear him because, the, first of all, he's not making any noise. And second of all, because the, uh, the machine is, is, the conveyor belt's making a lot of noise. Okay, and he's waiting there for her to notice the fact that he's actually watching her. Now he's been watching her on video camera. What does he do? Pulls out his ID, identifies himself. What doesn't he do? He doesn't physically touch her. He lets her put her hands in her own pants and take out the, the material. And she hands it to him. He keeps it, he holds it up to the camera, keeps it in evidence there's a female officer right around the corner and she's apprehended. Okay. Now, why was that important that we show you that? Well, one of the allegations that's oftentimes made by f female who are apprehended is that the male officer or male security personnel who apprehended her did something to her that he shouldn't have. 
So if you keep the videotape going and he hasn't put his hands on her, and he obviously, obviously hasn't said anything to her except you're under arrest or here's my ID, please come with me, you can refute any allegation like that. Always make sure you watch what goes on before and after if you can. Don't just look at the scene itself everybody wants. See, look at, the guy will say, look, see, he's doing that. Yeah, you want to see what happened. You want to watch the tape from before and you want to watch the tape afterwards, okay? Not just the segment that's shown there, okay? Um, when you look at videotapes like that, um, uh, I'm, I've seen thousands of hours of surveillance tapes. There's certain things you know what to look for. Um, it, look at it yourself. Watch it yourself more than once. If there is a soundtrack on it, the first thing that should twig in your mind is, have the, has anybody violated the criminal code? Because there's sections of the criminal code that deal with audio surveillance. Um, most people don't know this, but there is no crime involved in taking someone's picture. It's against the law to conduct audio surveillance unless you have a warrant or unless you have consent. But it is not against the law to take someone's picture. Now, if you harass them when you're doing it, or if you trespass their property, or if you beat them up, or if you do some damage to whatever to their property, that's different. Stalking, etc. But assuming you're just there with your camera, there's no law that says you can't take somebody's picture. Um, I had a neighbor, because he moved, it's a long story. The, I had a neighbor who used to do things that I found very annoying. And one of the things he used to do is wash his car. And he used a lot of soap in his car. And the, all this, this stuff, would, aside from the pollution aspect, would drain off his property on the mine. And that bothered me. And I asked him a number of times politely, which is difficult for a lawyer. But I asked him politely, please, you know, if you're going to do this, use this stuff with your car, at least wash it down onto the street and so it goes away. But don't leave all this, this foam and soap suds on my property. And the guy wouldn't listen. So I took out my video, one of my video cameras, I have a bunch of them, and I videotaped this guy doing it. I did it out and, you know, he could see that I was videotaping. There was no attempt for me to conceal it. Why, why should I? I'm standing on my own property. And I had my video camera and I, I'm taking the picture of the guy and he gets very upset because he doesn't think that I have the right to take a picture of him. He was standing there in his Speedo bathing suit he was the type of person who should not be wearing a Speedo bathing, skin-tight bathing suit. I don't, very few men can wear them without looking good in them, uh, but this particular guy was definitely not a candidate for you know, one of these catalogs. He, shouldn't have, he wasn't a male model, let's put it that way. And he was very upset that I was taking pictures of him you know, uh, spritzing the, the, with the water hose and the whole thing. And uh, he, didn't have the, uh, he didn't spray me with the water hose, but he did decide that he wanted to call the police. So the officer came around. The officer, <laughs> well, it's, anyway, the officer said to me, uh, what are you doing? And I said, I'm taking pictures. And I explained why and what the cause of the whole thing was. And, and he says, well, you're not allowed to take pictures. It's against the law. Awesome. Yeah. So I said, show me where it's against the law. The officer says, well, what do you mean? I said, well, wh where is the law written that I can't take pictures? I'm on my own property. He's on his own property. I'm using a standard video camera, and I'm taking ease in plain view of the public. Why can't I take a picture? So the police officer went back to his car, and he called in, and he's, I guess, I don't know, maybe he didn't know why, but anyway, he calls, and he comes back out to me, and he, he says, uh, are you the guy that wrote that book on visual evidence? <laughs> I said, yes. Okay. He says, just wait over here. He's going, you know, so he, I waited, and he went to talk to the guy, and he told the guy to, first of all, to put on some clothes. And then uh, he said to him, he explained to the fellow, and the fellow uh, went into his house, and he said, just leave him alone, and he won't do this anymore. And thank you, Mr. Goldstein, he takes off, okay. Um, so anyway, the neighbor was, afterwards he was out, it was in the evening, and he says, uh, he made a comment that I know all the police in York region, which is not true. I own, there's three guys I don't know. But anyway, um, the bottom line is he said, uh, the cop tells me you're some kind of expert on video. And I said, well, I'm not an expert, but I wrote a book on it, two-volume book. Um, and uh, so I got to talking to the neighbor, and we, we kind of patched things up. And then he, his house was for sale anyway, so I wasn't too worried. But the bottom line was this. Uh, the, the officer said something to me that I knew 
wasn't right. And I knew it wasn't right because I wrote a book on it. I know what the law is on video surveillance. I'm not an expert, but I do. And, but the officer probably thought that he was telling me the truth at the very beginning, that there probably was a, some law that you can't take pictures of somebody. Now, I tell you that story so I can tell you this one. There was a demonstration across the street from the courthouse uh, and where the American consulate is on University Avenue. Okay? That's the worst place for a consulate. It's on a main street. Every time they have a demonstration, it closes off University Avenue, which is, for those of you from Toronto, know what a ter how it's a main thoroughfare. Anyway, there was this police officer in full dress, and he was videotaping these people who were throwing things at the, at the, embassy, uh, the consulate and cheering. There was one group was Americans get out of some place, and the other group was Americans go back into some place. And there were these two factions, and everybody was yelling and screaming, and there was a lot of police presence. And, and there was this officer there in his uniform, and he was taking this videotape. So I'd finished in court, and I'd won my case, which is, happens every once in a blue moon. Anyway, I decided I was feeling good, and I came up to this officer, and I said, Officer, I said, do you have a warrant to take that video surveillance? And the officer looked down at me, you know, like the friendly giant, down, way down, I'll call Rusty, down, he says, I don't need a warrant. And I said, that's right. But do you know why you don't need a warrant? And he looked at me, and his face kind of, you know, kind of screwed up like he was trying to thinking. And he said, leave the area now, sir. <laughs> so as I was running as fast as my little legs could carry me to the subway, I thought to myself, the officer was right. I, he didn't need a warrant. But he didn't know why he didn't need a warrant. I guess maybe his superior officer had told him why. But the, real, the, the answer is, if you take pictures of something that's in plain view of the public, you don't require a warrant. Okay? You don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy when what you're doing is in plain view of the public. And most people don't understand that and they don't know that. Okay? And the Charter of Rights and all sorts of other privacy legislation all says that if you are in plain view of the public, if somebody can stand on their own property or on public property and see what you are doing, and they're not opening up your blinds, they're not you know, taking open your windows or your shutters or whatever, they're not poking a hole through your fence with their camera, they can just see what you're doing, irrespective of whether you're on your land or somebody else's land, you're in plain view of the public and that's fair game and I can take the person's picture. Now, does it matter that I have to use a zoom lens on the camera, a telephoto lens? No. That's just an extension of the human eye. Does it matter if I'm 20 stories up and you're 19 stories up and you're sunbathing naked on your balcony? No. If I can look down and see you, if any member of the public can look down and see what you're doing, then you're in plain view. Even though you may, from, from 19 stories below on the street, a person would see nothing but the bottom of the balcony slab. But if, if you can be seen, if you're in plain view of the public, then a person can take a picture of you. Okay? Most people don't know that and don't understand that. Audio surveillance is different. If you're having a conversation with your friend and I come up with a microphone and I poke that in your face and, and you say, please stop recording, and I don't, I've broken the law. If I don't have the consent of one or more of the people. So audio surveillance is a crime. Video surveillance is not. There are exceptions to the audio surveillance material. There are sections in the code dealing with consent or a warrant. But video surveillance, police don't need a, a, a warrant to take video surveillance unless there's a reasonable expectation of privacy there. Okay? So bear that in mind because it's one of the most misunderstood concepts with respect to video surveillance. Yes, sir? Well, there's a, yeah, that's a very good question. There were a few cases in which the, there, um, there were some American cases where they say that the fact that the audio portion of the videotape, uh, that it tainted the whole tape and they threw out the tape, but uh, they excluded it. But in Canada, what, what they would do is, I would think, is they would simply turn the sound off. See, there's one issue as to whether it's against, again, one issue, it's against the law to record it. There's another question of whether it's admissible. If you don't put it in, if you say there are sounds recorded, there are background noises, we're turning off the sound, we're not relying on the soundtrack at all, we're going to turn the sound to zero, put it on mute, 
then, then you don't have a problem with that because you're putting in the videotape for the video portion only. You're not putting in the audio portion. If you are going to put in an audio portion and it's any part of it is unintelligible, if it's hard to understand, then you have to make a transcript and the onus is on you to guarantee that that transcript is accurate or you can't put in the soundtrack. That's a Keeshig case. K-E-E-S-H-I-G. Keeshig. Okay? What they do about media reports from South yeah. South? In which that? Well, the problem with media reports is that you, if, unless you can cross-examine the person who either wrote the script or the commentator, you're probably not going to be able to use it because it is a hearsay statement. Um, there are a few cases in my book dealing with uh, media where the media brought in or the police went and seized media tapes and there was commentary from the, the television uh, reporter and they just simply turned it off. Yeah. I can't think of one with a sound beat. Think of the Rodney King beating. Yeah. Well, if they're part of the, if the sounds are part of the act itself, if it's the sound of the club coming down on the person's body or the fellow yelling, "Don't hit me! Don't hit me!" Um, that's, I think, part of the, the what is it, the raised gestator of the, and you might get that as an exception to the hearsay rule on that basis. But generally, I tell people, if you want to do audio recording, keep that separate from the video, because if you can't get the audio recorded, audio tape admitted, then, then in other words, they would run separate audio, and they would run, most, a number of the surveillance cameras don't have the capability of recording audio. They're picture only, go to closed circuit TV system. Um, the, um, the other aspect about, uh, about the uh, uh, video is um, another issue is with respect to tampering of the tape. Um, I like to see the source tapes, okay? And a lot of times the private investigators will not release the source tapes to you. They'll release only a copy. Um, you're going to have to make sure that it's an exact copy and that they haven't left out anything at the very beginning or the very end of the tape and they haven't done any editing on it. If you want to bring in a shortened version, make your source tapes available. My golden rule is never, ever erase a source tape. Okay? Copy it onto a master. Have your master, like say you've got three source tapes and you only want two minutes from each one. Make your master tape up of six minutes. Copy that, give it to the other side. Bring your source tapes and your master to court. But don't ever, ever erase source tapes. Okay? And as soon as you hear about something, tell your clients if they've got something recorded, pull the tape out of the system because a lot of them are on 12 or 24 hour loops. It'll go back and it'll erase the tape. Okay? So you want to take the tape out and, and uh, once you've ejected the tape, if it's VHS, there's a little thing here, you just break the tab and you can't record, uh, can't record on it again. The other types of tapes have things that switch over or whatever, but it's the same idea. Okay, you don't want them erasing, you don't want them touching the tape. Now what happens if they do accidentally erase the tape? Okay, there's an English case called Taylor versus Chief Constable of Cheshire where that happened. The uh, store owner recorded a shop theft. He called in all the police, a number of the police watched the tape, gave the tape to the police. The police got the record and play machines mixed up and they put the good tape into the machine and they recorded two hours of nothing on top of the perfectly good videotape with all... S no, they erased it. They erased the evidence. So how are they going to get it in the court? Well, after the Crown Prosecutor finished having an anxiety attack, what he did was he said, he had the peace of mind to say, who saw the tape before it was erased? And he called the officers who saw the tape before it was erased, put them on the stand one by one, individually when the other officers weren't in the room, and then he, he had one officer who recognized the accused. He had shot, arrested him for shoplifting at another location and he provided the identification evidence and the individual was uh, convicted and they went to appeal and it was upheld. The conviction was upheld on appeal. So what I tell people is if you've got a tape like that, you know, break the tab, have some other people watch it who can identify it. Don't put it on play, I'm sorry, on pause or still because that stretches the tape. Just, just um, 
uh, then take that and if they're going to make a copy, whatever, give it to the police, have the police give them a copy. But make sure that the source tape or, or a copy tape is put away safely. And don't store it in your glove compartment with all your little fridge magnets because it's going to be, there'll be nothing left on the tape. Okay? Um, I, I happen to notice surveillance cameras. I just happen to be very interested in surveillance. Whenever I, I go into banks or any other places, I kind of make it a, when I'm standing there in line waiting my 20 minutes in my five minute line to, to wait for something to happen, I'm, I'm looking around to see where the surveillance cameras are, where they're looking, how they're set up, where the cables are running, how they're calibrated, and those types of things, which drives my bank manager nuts because I'm always coming in and saying, you know that third camera on the side there, move it five degrees to the left, tilt it down a little bit, you get a much better picture and you won't get the flare out in the back. You again, right Goldstein? Get out of my bank. And that's, well, that's a long story. Okay, now um, we've got uh, a few minutes left. Um, the, I'm not going to go through the material. The handout material is, is good. I wrote it. Um, I wanted to tell you, though, about two new developments in the area of forensic video. Okay? Everybody's excited about digital now. Okay? Digital. Digital comes from the word digits, which means fingers. Okay? And I don't think that it's really such a great idea to call digital digital because I like the word video better. Video means I see in Latin, right? And evidence is true seeing, e-video. And digital is like fingers. And whenever you get too many fingers involved in something, there's always problems. What they're doing with the digital systems is this. The manufacturers figured out something they've known all along. It's very expensive to repair video machines where you've got the tape in constant contact with the tape head because most of the machines that they use for surveillance are time-lapse systems and the tape is always uh, being pulled against the tape head and it's just moving slowly and recording pictures. That puts a lot of wear and tear on the tape heads and the manufacturers cost them a lot of money to do the repair work, the maintenance work, uh, warranty work on these things. So they brought in the new idea of digital. What digital does is it takes the video signal from the camera and it records it first on a computer's hard drive and it compresses it. And then it takes that image and it moves it over onto a digital tape, which is very also a high compression tape. So the tape you bring into the court that you think is your source tape is in fact a copy of what was on that computer hard drive. Now you've got two immediate problems there. First of all, how do you know that what's on the tape that you bring in the court is the same as what the hard drive of the computer recorded? Right? Because a digital, a digital uh, VCR is really just a computer hard drive. Well, the other thing is, how do you know that the system was working properly when it transferred that to here? Well, there are watermarking systems which embed a little coded signal on so you can tell if there's been any tampering with it. And there's also something called error correction which is a system within the hard drive that if it writes to the tape and the tape says I didn't get everything, it rewrites it until it gets it right. So there are very, the newer technologies now do have um, either error correction or watermarking systems or both so that you can come into court, you're not going to schlep the hard drive. You're not going to bring the digital VCR. It's, first of all, it's probably very big and heavy because they're like hard drives of computers. So you're going to bring that tape and you've got to be able to testify. Your authenticating witness will testify that it's a true and accurate copy of the original. Now, if somebody can see the tape as it's like on the monitor as it's being recorded, you call that person as a qualified witness who can say what I saw on the monitor is what you see on the tape in the courtroom and then you don't have a problem. But the new digital systems now, you have to be careful with them because what they're doing is when they're compressing, they're also, they could be dropping frames and losing data. So if in those types, some of those systems, you're better off just taking a video still picture and bringing in the video still picture and having somebody authenticate it from the videotape itself. And don't hesitate to do that in general. If you've got a videotape where there's other things happening, I'll give you a perfectly good example. I, saw, I had to edit a surveillance videotape of this guy who went to the beach with his kid. And he claimed he had injuries in his back and he couldn't move his back muscles. And the video, the, the private investigator got a videotape of him putting his kid in this little swing at the beach and pulling back with his arm and letting his kid go sailing through the universe and the swing back and forth. And the kid is like about eight months old, nine months old, is giggling, as, you know, and the kid's flying about, arms and legs flailing out of this little thing. And the father is swinging the kid and moving this part of his body that he claimed he couldn't move. Well, a very attractive woman walks by. 
Well, the, the, the camera operator stopped watching the fellow who with the kid flying through the air and watches this woman as she's, I don't know what the word is, sashaying, of gliding, whatever, through the scene, and, and like Jello on springs, this woman. And she's kind of jiggling through, and the, the, the camera operator wasn't watching the surveillance target. He was taking pictures of this person. Now, all of a sudden, we've got this, and I, of course, we edited that whole segment out, but the numbers jumped all of a sudden because there was a whole bunch of the surveillance videotape that was missing. So we ended up just cutting it off at that one portion and not showing the rest of, for the purposes of, of the edited, because we, we had enough. But the point is that, that in that situation, there was something that interrupted and that was completely irrelevant, although perhaps a lot more interesting for some jurors to watch than, than the target of the surveillance, but it was irrelevant and we didn't want to put it in because it would prejudice the jury and they wouldn't remember anything of what they had seen about this guy, you know, with his arm going through the air. They'd pay attention to the, uh, the, the female uh, who, had not, who wasn't the target of the surveillance. Said, the really funny part was afterwards, his wife sees him oogling the jello on springs and she comes up and gives him a smack and takes the kid out of the swing and walks off with it. We didn't want to show that either, because he's standing there holding his arm like, oh, I hurt my arm. And he's going to say it's because he had a pain in his arm from being so you know, friendly with his kid instead of from his wife hitting him. But anyway, the bottom line was that we had the tape, the component. We showed what we needed to. So when you see things like that, always look at the before and after. You always want to see the whole image. OK, the last part I want to show you is a completely different type of film, uh, pardon me, video. It's not a surveillance video. This is a situation where you have to explain a process to somebody. And it's very difficult to explain it in words. But if you show it to them on video, they'll get the idea of what went right or went wrong. OK? Now, in this particular videotape, which is from the States, this fellow was injured when he was running a printing press. His hand up to the elbow got caught in the printing press and it was mangled very badly. That part wasn't shown. But how it happened was a question, how could this guy have done it? They said, well, one side, the insurance company said, well, he did it on purpose. He was just trying to collect the insurance money. And the plaintiff's lawyer said, you've got to be out of your mind. Nobody does that for money. And we think we have a theory as to how the accident happened. But to try to explain it in plain English would have been difficult. So what they did was they made a videotape. And after you see the videotape, you tell me if you understand what their theory was as to how the accident, if it was an accident, because this is only a theory, how it actually took place. So let's take a look at that. OK. All right, and we'll press the play button. My VCR flash is 12, but I'm a lawyer. So anyway, OK. Now I'm going to put on the sound here. See at the top an ink reservoir the pressmen call a fountain. Beneath the fountain is a series of small form rollers. Just below the form rollers is a large metal roller. The printing plate with the image on it is wrapped around this roller. As it turns, the image picks up ink on the plate and transfers it to a rubber sheet that is wrapped around the lower roller. This rubber sheet is called the blanket. Between the two rollers and the front of the press is the safety bar. Finally, the paper runs against the bucket and picks up ink, which forms the printed image. And there is a gap in the top roller where the ends of the printing plate come together and are attached to the top roller. The lower roller has a matching gap where the blanket is attached. Where the two rollers meet, there is a safety bar. When this bar is moved up or down, the machinery will stop within about a quarter of a turn. The last step before starting the job is to clean the plate and the blanket. This removes dust, excess heat, and other substances that could affect the quality of the print. If the press is running at fine speed, the speed of the machine during a press run, and if a hand were to slip into this space, it could trip the safety bar. But the rollers would continue to revolve for about another quarter turn, and that extra quarter turn is enough to 
random packages of the two of them together. And in the process, crush anything in the way. But if better to service the fountain area and adjust the ink flow on this model of the medium vest, he has to be high enough to reach the control. There are built-in steps provided on the vest for this purpose. Actually, Neely has had at least two versions of these built-in steps. On the older Model 29, the step folded up out of the way when not in use and back down when you need it. On the newer Model 29, the model involved in this accident, there are two steps which store in the down position. If you want to use them, you pull forward to release them and then lift them. Once they're up, they slip over a pin projected from the machine, and they're held in this position by the spring. As you can see, the pin on this side is slightly more than one half inch long. But, over here, on the other step, the actual step that was involved in this accident, the pin is only slightly more than one quarter inch. This is the step that failed Okay, now what happened obviously was the step failed to hold, the man fell, he put his hands forward to keep him from falling, and the hands were drawn into the machine and crushed. Now that was the plaintiff's theory about how the accident occurred. And after seeing this videotape, the defendant settled. It's simple. Very, very, now you try to get an expert witness to explain all that in a court of law or I can show you this videotape. Do you understand how the accident occurred? Sure you do. Everybody does. It's very simple. The step fell. The pin didn't hold. The step gave way. The man fell forward and his hands went into the machine. It's very simple. Okay? That's the beauty of demonstrative evidence is that you can give somebody a picture and show them the things. And you tell them that this is our theory. You're not telling them this is what happened. This is the plaintiff's theory as to how the accident could have occurred and you show them the comparison between the left and right pin and explain what, why the person has to be up that high you know, uh, doing with the ink reservoir, whatever and why, the, why they have to you know, wipe the machine, etc. And that type of a videotape, it's not very long and that's the case all summed up. That's the power of visual evidence. And that type of forensics is the comparison. That's the forensic component to it. Okay. Now, in, in Ontario, there you can get a court order to actually videotape a, a, a process, um, a uh, manufacturing process. There are a couple of beer cases, uh, material found in beer bottles, and they, they got video. Uh, they got, I guess, uh, orders to go in and do videotaping of the uh, brewery's process. I won't mention the names of the brewery. Um, people are always stuffing things into the, you know, the little snail in the ginger beer, but etc. Uh, what was that called? Don, was it Donahue and Stevenson? Was it Jeer and the... Uh, Jeer? I, I thought that was a great case. That, and now they make the bottles clear. Do you know why they put those substances, soft drinks in clear bottles? It's because it's a lot easier for them for product quality. They, they just pass it through a sensor and it looks for anything that's floating around in the, in the, that's not supposed to be in there except in, in the beer, in the bottle. Or the, they, that's why they make them a certain color and a certain size, etc. They just shoot light through them or whatever and they be, they're able to see what's inside the glass bottles. Because there's no real reason why you have to, except for some, some substances need darker color bottles, but most don't. That's why they put it in clear bottles. Anyway, um, the, uh, the last part I just want to tell, talk, tell you about, we've got a few minutes left, has to do with what's the newest, the very newest, hottest thing in video, forensic video, is uh, the forensic video identification and comparison. And what they're doing in that situation is they're taking a known picture of the accused or of the suspect and they're comparing it with an unknown picture of a person who they think is the accused. And that case is the Cooper case. It's a uh, uh, two, year 2000 case from British Columbia. And what they did there was they, they, um, there was a fellow who, was, who robbed a bank and uh, even though he was a few feet away from the clerks, nobody could remember what he looked like. He wasn't positively identified. Some, one of the officers in British Columbia, Grant Fredericks, 
Uh, he published this guy's picture and, and some parole and some other officers identified the guy. And what they did was they brought up on the screen in the courtroom a picture, a known picture of the accused from his various criminal records. Uh, and they put up this unknown picture of the suspect and they said to the judge, we think it's one and the same guy and here's why. Now you're going to immediately say, well, the police officer is giving opinion evidence. He's pointing out all these things and saying, see the similarity in the chin and the eyebrows and all. I mean, why couldn't a jury do that themselves or the judge do that? The trier of fact make the comparison. But then the officer went the one step further and said, well, I think it's the same individual. I'll leave it to you whether that, that, that evidence should have been admitted. But what was really important about the case was they digitally enhanced the pictures because the picture that was in, taken from the bank surveillance camera wasn't uh, the same size and wasn't the same as so they had to enlarge it uh, digitally and they had to change the contrast and the judge allowed all of that and said that it wasn't tampering with the image. They weren't, they weren't actually changing color, they were just changing shadow and they were changing uh, a contrast in, in the picture. It's a very important case. Everybody in the security industry said, yes, this is a great case. It's about time somebody came up with this decision. It's well reasoned. It's a good, good case if you, if you read the whole case. There was other evidence. That wasn't the only evidence. There was other evidence in the case. Um, there were three different kinds of identification evidence. But that's now become the new, the latest thing with digital, is to be able to actually take an unknown, uh, a, a picture of an unknown person with a picture of who you think it is and compare the two and then draw the conclusion it was one and the same person. Um, there is visual recognition software available. CIA, FBI uses it where the computer will match thousands and thousands of, of faces to known faces in data banks. It's, it's, um, there's all sorts of new technology they're coming out with now. Um, it's interesting that Grant Fredericks, who's this constable, was a constable with Vancouver Police Department, was hired by one of the digital video companies to sell their products, uh, the, the, the products that they use now for, for police video. He actually left the police department and went to work for this company privately. He was a former uh, a TV uh, announcer. He had a lot of experience. He used to do all the Crime Stoppers work in, in BC. He was a video producer before he became a police officer. Now he's gone back to the private sector. But there are a few other cases like that that are going to be coming out where they're doing that type of, of digital comparison. And the, the effects are striking. I mean, the computers will actually pick people out from a crowd match them to thousands of other known pictures and tell you that it's one and the same person. Uh, they used it in the Vancouver, Can the Stanley Cup riots and the Canuck riots in, uh, uh, Vancouver Canuck riots in, in Vancouver uh, a few years ago where they had thousands and thousands of, of feet of footage. People had taken a lot of video and the TV stations were always out there. And they had the same guy maybe shown from two or three different angles. They put it all on computer, they described all the scenes and the computer picked out running off of CD-ROMs, picked out all the same, like it was the same guy wearing a yellow raincoat beating up somebody. If they had three different computer uh, videos of that same guy, the computer would find all instances where that individual was beating up somebody wearing a yellow coat, and it would then show the same picture, the same event from three or four different angles. And they were able to identify lots of people that way. It's great stuff. For any of you who, who are interested in some, uh, seeing what the new satellite technology cause, is, can do, there's a movie out called Enemy of the State. Part of it's Hollywood. I, I, uh, I know a fellow who um, works in the States, and I told him about the movie, and he went there, and he said, oh, he, he was laughing. I said, are you laughing because this is so much Hollywood? He said, no, we're so far beyond that. He said, you wouldn't believe what we can do now with cameras. Well, the bottom line is this. Um, we're going to see more and more uh, digital, more and more video coming into the courts because it's such powerful evidence. The juries are very comfortable with it. Juries, everybody has a TV in their house. And juries think, oh, it's on TV? Good, we'll watch it, you know. It's like The Sopranos. They think it's the same thing. Or, or The X-Files. A lot of people think The X-Files is real. It's not. 
I mean, I wish, only wish we had some of that technology. But you'll see more and more of that being brought into court. The latest thing now is the, is the um, video prints. A lot of people like taking prints off of videotapes. They use them because it's, it's a documentary form of evidence you can put in the picture even if the video is not admitted. And uh, judges are very comfortable with, you know, we have a picture, it's like a piece of paper. They can put three holes in it and put it. If a judge can put three holes in something and put it in a binder, he or she is happy. Remember that. It's a lot easier than taking videos home. Yes, sir. Well, you have to show, you have to authenticate the videotape first, and then you have to explain how you did it and say it's a true and accurate reproduction. You don't usually have to hold the, 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 the image on freeze frame and compare it to the picture. You just simply have your, your expert witness or whatever just simply say it's a, this is a copy of what was on there and this is how it was produced. You, you know, and explain it that way. There's, there's, um, uh, you're, you're admitting that it's only a, you know, one frame Usually it's one frame, not one field. And there's, what, 30 frames per, uh, uh, per second. Each frame is two fields, odd and even. So there would be 30 frames per second. So it's 1 30th of a, fr a second. It's as if you took a camera and took a picture at a 30th of a second. OK? Well, or you can, it doesn't necessarily have to be the technician. It can just be the, the person who, who compares it and says, this is a true and accurate reproduction. Of, of what they saw if they were at the scene, or else they can say, uh, yes, so this is the work that I did. Yeah. I mean, but if, if you, you, the person who is authenticating it has to have some connection with the videotape itself, either to have made the print right off the video or to have made the video in the first place and says, I remember what I took a picture of, and that's just one of, of you know, one thirtieth of a second picture from the one second of all the other seconds that are in the video. Most videos that are brought to court where they show events happening, they're not really that long. You want to keep, after 20 minutes, people lose interest. You want to keep your videos generally in the neighborhood of five to eight minutes. That's enough. You can put a lot into five to eight minutes. If you figure you're taking 30 frames per second times 60 seconds times eight minutes, that's a lot of pictures. That's like looking at thousands and thousands of pictures. A picture really, they say a picture is worth a thousand words and a video is worth volumes. That's not original to me, but it's a good thing to remember. Um, just be careful with it, because it can backfire on you, OK? If, if there's some mistake in it that the other side's expert will pick up, it, it can make you look bad. It's, if things like left-right reversal or editing, some other editing problem. But if there is a problem with it, disclose it right up front to the judge to take all the sting out of the other side's cross-examination. I had a, a private investigator one time, that, and what she had done was to copy the tape, and I think it was three seconds shorter the copy than the original, because they hadn't started the tape at the two machines at the right time. She explained that right up front to the judge. I said, that's fine. First thing the defense lawyer stands up is, how come one's three seconds later was shorter than the other? And the judge says, We've, she's explained that already. Get on with it. You know? And if you do that, if there is a problem, explain it up front and, and get it out of the way. Don't hide it. Okay, because otherwise it's just going to come back to haunt you. It's like anything. It's like being honest with your wife. It always comes back to haunt you. We won't go there. I want you to know, by the way, I'm happily married. I'm married, my wife's happy. Okay, yes, sir. Talking about expectation of privacy on some surveillance video, wasn't there a case where some police were caught in a, in a storage room and, uh, and, and on video, and the suggestion was that they expected privacy? Well, the, 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 expect the reasonable expectation of privacy, it's objective and subjective. I'm not familiar with the case, but you have to look at, at whether the people actually believed that they, were having, they would have privacy in that situation, and also whether it was reasonable for them to believe that in those situations they'd have privacy. I mean, if I go into a hotel room, I expect to have privacy. If I leave the hotel room door open and anybody who's walking down the, the hallway can look in, my expectation of privacy is gone. Just because I'm in a, a washroom doesn't mean I have privacy if I leave the cubicle door open. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's not just my expectation. You have to look at whether or not it's reasonable under the circumstances. It's both an objective and subjective test. Well, is it reasonable for the person to expect to have privacy in those situations? And I think that's maybe what the case was getting at. But you can remove a reasonable expectation of privacy by doing three things. Number one, you can post a notice or warning sign that tells people the area is under surveillance. Don't expect to have privacy here. You're being watched. Okay? Number two, you can get them to sign a contract where they give away their rights or a waiver. 
if it's an employment situation. Okay? And the third thing is if the camera is very obvious and open, if it's something there where you could argue that there was an implied consent to take the pictures because they saw the camera there, they saw the little red light bleeping on. and You always have to have a little, little red light flashing on and off because people think if there's no red light there, the camera's not on. I don't know why, but if people see something with a red light flashing, right away, hi, Mom. Right? So you always have, that's why they, there's no f functional reason why those cameras need red lights to flash. It's just that it attracts people's attention. They look up at it. You ever look at any surveillance videotapes of people doing something? They come rushing into the building, their heads down. As soon as they're running out of the building to escape, that's when you want to take the picture of them. Because then you see their face. Because people always look up when they're running out. They don't want to bump into somebody. When they're coming in, they, they, want, you know, they might just change their mind. So you want to get the picture when they're going out, not when they're coming in. right? And, and also, if you take a picture outside the building, you can see them putting on the mask before they come into the building. We've got tapes like that, too. Yes, sir? Well, well posting that sign uh, that you're on surveillance yeah. allow you to get audio evidence? Well, in, in some situations, uh, well, you have to first of all be careful about the language issue. Because if, if you post a sign in English in an area where people don't speak English, you know, it has to be uh, an, an issue. It has to be something reasonable. You could argue implied consent using a sign for audio, but I wouldn't. I would use a sign only for video because I mean, used to have signs that said this area under electronic surveillance. I never liked that because what is electronic surveillance? I, always, I also tell clients never put a sign up that says this area is protected by a video camera. Video cameras don't protect anything. They're machines. People protect people, okay? Um, the, the, you can say the area may be monitored but there's also issues of liability for, for um, occupiers of liability and landowners and landlords liability when you put up a camera. If you give someone uh, an expectation of security, like a false sense of security, because people think that the area is under surveillance when it really isn't. You know, parking lots, underground parking lots have a real problem with that, with putting up cameras. Never put up a dummy camera. Okay, you can use it as a decoy. Always have your real camera someplace else, but never just put up a dummy camera, because what good is it if if the somebody's already committing a crime there? The the deterrent effect of the surveillance is gone anyway. You can use a dummy camera, a non-functioning camera, as a decoy. So guys smash that, thinking they've broken the camera, and then they run around and ransack the place while your real camera is recording. You know what's going on, but don't ever use a dummy camera where you've got people because to protect people because as soon as they smash the camera they're just as likely to turn around and smash one of the employees and the employees may think the camera was there and may have thought that they you know may have taken some risks thinking well if anybody comes in we'll have their picture you know or they'll go and they'll smash the videotape machine itself um, I went into one store where they had the camera up there and uh, I could see the camera was ready to fall off. If somebody just took a broom, give a whack the camera, the camera would go flying, and there's the guy's video surveillance. So I went out and I told this guy, he didn't speak English, I told the guy who owned the convenience store that you should really get the camera adjusted and put on a proper bracket. And he said, yes, thank you. And then he said, yes, thank you. Every five seconds after I did anything else, I realized he had absolutely no idea what I was saying. So I just wrote a note to this, the company that set up the equipment, and they went in and they fixed it for him for free because I know the guy who runs the company, surveillance company. But anyway, the point is I didn't want this guy to be relying on a piece of equipment that was inherently, def you know, the way it was set up. It just wasn't working. Most of my clients are in the alarm and security business, and I do a lot of consulting in that type of area. So I get into some of these things. Um, yes, sir? <coughs> Yeah. Uh, how long is it likely to be, do you think, before the courts have a, have a, uh, a, a high degree of skepticism? Of, uh, well, it's, it's very easy to do. It's hard to detect. But it goes back to any other type of evidence, because I've heard that comment many times, and it's a very good one. My answer is this. Any witness can lie. And you can't put in a videotape without some type of authenticating witness. It doesn't have to be an eyewitness to the event. event. It can be an expert witness or a qualified witness. But it's like any other type of evidence. If somebody wants to come in and lie and say that's a true and accurate reproduction of what I saw and it's fair and it's not misleading, 
then it's, 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 uh, the, the picture is only as good as the witness who stands behind it. Um, and sometimes there are signs that I've seen faked videos and I know how to detect them, look for shadow detail. Somebody's walking around, the sun's up at the one side and there's everything else is throwing a shadow. How come the guy who's been superimposed is not throwing a shadow? Because he's been superimposed, he was never there in the first place. You know, um, you can look at weight displacement. When people go to sit down on something, if it's heavy, their butt's going to uh, displace. If it's light, they will crush or, or misshape the thing they're sitting on. If they go to sit on something and there's no displacement of their thigh or what they're sitting on, you know there's something wrong with the picture because people take up time and space. And there, you, you look, there's things you can look for and find in pictures. If a guy's got six fingers on his hand, something's wrong. If it's webbed, that's a different story. But, you know, I mean, there are things that you can look for. And I've seen faked pictures. And if you know what you're looking for, you, there are electronic ways of testing for fakes in pictures. You can put a videotape on a scope, oscilloscope, and look for certain things. But you're right. I mean, if, a, if you can get a, a, nine, a demented 15-year-old who's a hacker, if he can hack into the Pentagon, he can hack in and, and, you know, and create a picture that way. Um, I haven't heard of any cases, Canadian cases, where that's happened. But it, maybe someday it'll come around. But somebody's going to get charged with perjury. Because if somebody says that's a true and accurate reproduction of what they saw, and it wasn't, and they get caught, it's like lying on the witness stand with anything else. You know, I mean, I, 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 wouldn't, I know how to fake a picture. And I could probably fake it well enough that most of you couldn't detect it. But I'm not going to do it. Why? Because I'm an honest lawyer. Now, that may be an oxymoron to some people. But the, the fact is that there's too much risk. It's, no client is worth that. And, and I don't think anything is worth that. But there might be people who are trying it, and that's why we have to be ever vigilant with any kind of evidence. But people lie all the time for various reasons. So that's my answer, is that maybe it'll happen one day. I hope it, I hope it happens in the States first so we can learn from their mistakes. <laughs> okay, on that positive note, and with all due respect to our American friends, I'm going to say thank you very much for attending. If you have any questions of Mr. Crawford, he's here to answer your questions. Um, the, uh, if you need my help on anything, give me a call. The call is free. I usually get phone calls late at night, collect from tuck to yuck duck from Crown prosecutors who want my help the night before a case. Um, but um, I'll be happy to help you out. Um, if you need my assistance, give me a call. I've, I've got thousands of cases in file folders everywhere that I, that I use to update the book. Carswell likes it when I give a plug for the book, so there it is. That's my one and only plug. Um, and uh, so I hope that you've benefited from the seminar today. I hope that uh, it was enjoyable and perhaps even entertaining and that you learned something. And uh, if, uh, I hope that you'll go out there and use forensic science in your, in your cases because it's, it's about time that lawyers come into the, uh, to this century and start using some modern, what is it, the 21st century now? I've lost track, it's been so long. Uh, but uh, uh, it's about time we start using it, and uh, it's only going to be for the benefit of our clients. Okay? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.